This is the Doddcast. I'm your host, Nathaniel Dodson. In today's podcast, I sat down with Alex Hillman, an entrepreneur, a co-working expert, and a friend of mine. Alex is a mainstay in the co-working and startup community, both in Philadelphia and around the world. You can check out more about Alex at his website, dangerouslyawesome.com, or at indiehall.org, where you'll find information about the co-working space we talk about here. In our chat, Alex and I talk about co-working, what it is, how it works, and where so many people get it wrong. We talk about some of the challenges of managing a space for hundreds of small business owners. I recall a time I got blocked from coming to my office in Indy Hall, a time that he hacked his school's network, and one way he thought I brought value to the community when we first met. We talk about all this and much more on this, the fifth episode of the Dodcast. We're rolling. Uh, welcome into the Dodcast. It's my podcast where I talk about things that I like to talk about with people who are much cooler than myself. And today I've got Alex Hillman here with us. Alex, how you doing, man? <laughs> with that <laughs> intro, wow. Uh, I don't know if I'm cooler than you, but um, <laughs> For I'm sure. really, really excited to be here. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate you being here. Um, so a lot of my audience, they're not going to know who you are. Um, honestly, half the time, I'm not sure I know who you are because you're wearing so many stinking hats and doing so much. If you bumped into somebody on the street... Like, what's the elevator pitch in terms of who is Alex Hillman? Who, who am I? Well, look, I'm just, I'm just Alex. What do I do? So I, I split my time sort of in two worlds that uh, overlap uh, in p- independent creative people who want to do their own thing. Um, what I do now uh, is I uh, is really twofold. <clears throat> Sorry. What I do now is really twofold. One is this place we are this is indie hall this is a co-working Beautiful. space thank you love this place um and love the other pl- i love the other space too you've played a role in this space as well <laughs> both as a as a member and literally i'm looking at the floor right now and you helped <laughs> lay the carpet in this floor um this is a co-working space but not just any co-working space um it's a community and a clubhouse of independent creative people here in philadelphia um i started this 12 years ago hmm. which makes us one of the oldest co-working spaces in the world um and so i spend my days not just running it, I've got a team that really does the day-to-day operations, but thinking about what does it mean to be around other people pursuing your business, pursuing your creativity, and finding ways to make your world work around the way you want to work. Um, Parallel to the work I do at Indie Hall, I also teach a class uh, with my business partner, Amy Hoy, uh, who's a software designer and developer. An all-around kick-butt chick. Absolutely. She's someone who I think you should absolutely have on this show. (laughs) Okay. Um, I'll mark that down. Amy and I, about eight years ago, turned to each other and said, we have all these really smart, creative friends who are hopping from startup to startup, miserable to miserable, and looking for the thing that is going to make them happy. And uh, they really don't see uh, any options in between getting a startup job where they're going to be miserable and going out and raising a bunch of money from a venture capitalist to start a company where they now have to grow it to a certain size, feed all of these mouths. and the reality is that there's so many options in between. We wanted to teach people about the options in between, how to bootstrap a business using what you've already got, specifically designed for the designers, the developers in our own communities, mm. and teaching them sort of reverse engineering what we knew uh, or what we did instinctively, I should say, to figure out what our best options were. Sort of the easiest way to describe what we teach is helping you see the Venn diagram between who you're best suited to serve what it is they actually already need, want, and want to buy, what would they actually pay for, and what can you make using the resources you already have. It's important to make a product that people want, not a product that you want to see. Right, Right. and there's nothing wrong with making things that you want to see in the world, but don't feel upset when people don't want to buy them. You're not entitled to that. So we teach people um, sort of a research-based approach, uh, how to go out and observe your audience, sort of, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with ethnography. um, but I can't say I am. The the idea of ethnography is from a research perspective, you want to interact with the audience, but from from an observational perspective. So think of like Jane Goodall observing gorillas and trying to understand their behavior, you are Jane Goodall for your creative audience trying to look at what they do, look at what they say when they don't think you're in the room saying it, right? Because people will respond to a question the way they think you want them to respond. Mm. 
versus what do people say when they're in a moment of pain, a moment of crisis, a moment of frustration, and taking that, distilling it down to like a real understanding of what do people really care about? And again, where's the overlap between what they perceive as a problem hmm. and what you can actually help them with? Yeah. So I spend my time in those two worlds. Um, again, the overlap is really creative people who want to do things their own way. Um, but ultimately, whether it's because you feel lonely and isolated and want to be around other creative people, come to Indie Hall, or you want to make stuff that people actually want to buy, come and hang out with us on Stack I have to say, bricks. When, I, when I first um, signed up or bought a subscription, I'm not sure what the term is that you use. Membership. Membership. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a good way to put it. When I first bought a membership and became a, a member at Indie Hall, um, I remember right out of the gate, uh, my business was very small at the time. And it was the affordability factor yeah. that was great. And it wasn't, it, I didn't even really do it because I was lonely. I was just kind of like, it's time to go spread your wings a little bit. Yeah. You know, kind of like you said, there, there are steps in between. Like you don't just have to be working in your basement and then go for venture capital right out of the gate, mm -hmm. right? You can you can incrementally build in between as well. Totally. And this is such an easy step to make because it was, you know, it wasn't like I was looking at, oh, that's a $1,500 office space, you know, boom, that, that I'm going to be on the hook for. And then I have to force myself to make it work, which maybe you can, maybe you can't. But especially if you're married and have kids and something like that, you might not be in a situation to... Yeah. To do something like that. And, you know, sometimes it's the utility of you need a place to go once in a while. You know, if you're, you know, whether you're in this neighborhood or you come into the city like you do from just outside of Philadelphia, um, I think there's also this element of, especially when you're just getting started out, uh, I love this idea of like a work costume. And so think about when, when you go get a job, like your first job, you have put on a work costume for your interview. You put on a suit and tie or you put on a nice dress uh, or jacket uh, because you want to look a certain way. You want to feel a certain way. You want to present a certain way. When you go out on your own, when you start your own thing, what's your work costume? Right. Just It is. Right. Uh, <laughs> there's this awesome uh, talk that was given by a guy named uh, Mike Quackenbush, who produces independent professional wrestling here in Philadelphia. Okay. I and like he, his last name, it's Quackenbush. A, it's a great <laughs> last name, right? Um, and he talks, I learned from him about this idea that for professional wrestlers, there is a character and a costume and a persona and all these things. Um, and there's some ritual and practice that people go through before they get in the ring and there's certain things that they do not do outside of the ring they are for in ring only and part of that is their costume right the, the costume and the persona they put on so i love that idea of professionalism and becoming a professional requires a costume that suits who you are right and i think what sucks about the sort of recent history of work is we've only ever been shown a certain number yeah. of and style of and variety of work costumes you come into indie hall and there's a lot of different kind of work costumes here the place is just one part of it but you sort of see how other people conduct themselves and i think historically like bankers would dress a certain way like a banker when he dressed to go to the wedding or the ball would be a hundred percent different than like the farmer or just your general shopkeeper in town i'm talking you know exactly. two three hundred years ago kind exactly of thing. exactly so it is kind of an interesting I, maybe it's just humans are kind of we, we we don't, we don't all want to dress up with the suit and tie. Yeah. We show up for the interview with the suit and tie, and then it's like, all right, first day of work, now I'm going to be myself. Exactly. <laughs> I'm going to be exactly, exactly what I wasn't in the interview. <laughs> yeah, and I think that, you know, if anything, over the years, Indie Hall has been a place where we reward people for, and by we, I don't mean me and, like, the staff. I mean, as a community, we reward people who show up and just try to be their best selves, um, be who you are. Hmm. Guys, you know, if, if you're trying to be something you're not, we can sniff it out pretty quickly because um, we've we've seen a lot of that yeah, over the that. years. Um, but if you show up and you you be your best self and you show up curious and generous, um, it's I think it's a place that rewards that in a lot of ways. Hmm. Um, Indie Hall is yes. a co-working space. Yes. What does that mean? For people who don't know what co-working is, have never been introduced to the idea. A million dollar why, question. <laughs> why should I care about co-working? Yeah. What, what is it? Well, and, and it's sort of a tough question to answer. Uh, I think it was easier to answer like seven or eight years ago. Um, today, the word co-working is about as specific as the word restaurant. So if you said, Alex, what is a restaurant? I'd say it's a place where I'm probably going to pay money to probably get some food. But I'd need more information, right? I okay. need to know, is it Thai food? Is it Italian food? Is it fine dining, fast casual? Or is it that dump down the street? A dive bar, right? <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with any of those. They're just all different. Mm. Um, and the tricky thing about today in 2018 is we only have one word to describe all of these categories. So uh, I'll talk about what I think co-working is. Okay. 
Um, and I think co-working is very simply the intentional choice to be around other people when you don't have to be. To recognize that while in my work day, for part of my work day, some of my work day, all of my work day, whatever makes sense for me, that being around other people is going to be better for me than being on my own. Mm. And I think of co-working more as a verb. It's a thing you do. I'm going to choose to go co-working. I'm going to be in a place with other people that also chose to be in that place because they want to be around other people. What they're doing doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, today, more and more people can work on laptops and cell phones for a large portion of their day. Mobility is a huge part of our work. So, I mean, think about it this way. If you can work from anywhere, why wouldn't you choose the best place for your work? And not just one, that's not just one place, right? That could be what's the best place for your work today hmm. or for the work you need to get done this week or for the client that you're working on or for the project that you're working on to sort of know that there's different places and different environments that are going to help you get the work done better. Um, we try to cater to uh, a bunch of those uh, and make it easy for you to choose what you need at that particular day. So in our case, people come in, you join with a membership. Right, membership uh, for us varies only based on how often you're physically here in the co-working space. About 350 members are members of Indie Hall, um, but only 20% of them or so call this their primary office. They have a dedicated desk where they can leave their things. Mm. They may not be here every day, but this is a, a, a an address for them. You're talking the, actually they could use it as a business address. They actually can use it as a business address. You just okay. got to pick up your mail. You'd be surprised how many people get mail shipped here. And then and I'm not talking like junk mail. We get a lot of that too. But like <laughs> packages stay here for weeks. It's very yeah. strange. Yeah. Um, Don't you want that? I, right. I, I get packages and I want them right away. <laughs> yeah, right. And like uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me. Um, so yeah, you can use it as a professional address, which for some people is actually really valuable. It's part of that work costume. Mm. I, I have a place that I call my professional home, not just in Philadelphia, but in Old City. We're in Old City, Philadelphia, which has- A block away from Independence Hall. Yeah, man. We've got like culture and history and context um, where you can walk a block away and go to the Liberty Bell um, or like grab lunch on Independence Mall. Uh, you can walk in a block in almost any direction, get amazing mm -hmm. food. There's so much great like food and drink in this neighborhood. The river's two blocks away. The... So, and it's easy to get from, you know, the subway is a block away. So you can get to other parts. This is a super, super awesome part of the city to mm -hmm. be in. Um, and it's not like the center city, you know, skyscrapers yeah. and stuff like Business, that. Business financial district. It's, it's still totally different vibe. really human scale. Um, you know, you see familiar faces. You see, get to know your neighbors. A lot of small businesses and boutiques and restaurants and shops and cafes. And um, there's a community outside of Indie Hall that Indie Hall is a part of as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then the other parts of Indie Hall that I think are, are interesting and maybe less visible uh, is, again, this notion of how do you become a part of a professional community. So, you know, maybe someone, uh, maybe you've joined like a professional association or an online community for people in your industry. And like what a are business the business network kind of thing you're yeah, talking? Yeah. Yeah. Business networks or, you know, you know, a, a community, I'm thinking like a Facebook group full of, you know, illustrators or videographers mm -hmm. okay. and same sort of thing. People ask questions, people get help. Um, people Pass are stuck on things. Back and forth. All those things, right? right? So the difference with Indie Hall is it's all of those things. It's all the benefits of all, any professional association or club, except it's not limited to one industry. And it's IRL. And it's in real life. It's also online. Right. So uh, we have as uh, everything that can happen in the physical space, and you can walk in the room, and you can come and you can interact with people face to face. That's what a lot of people love. But in between the days that you're here, we also have a really vibrant online community using the chat and email discussion list. Where you know, because again, 350 members, but only 20% of them are here every day. You have a question, and you're stuck on something. You can turn to the person next to you and ask for help. Or celebrate a win. You know, you just landed a new client. High five. Somebody gets how how good that is for you and how that feels. Um, but you're not limited to who's in the room, right? So if you're stuck on something, you can, with one email, reach hundreds of people. And even if it's something obscure, like we had an email go out to the list last week from somebody who wants to make a set of children's blocks, like wooden blocks that are printed on all six sides right, right. With, under a particular theme. And he's like, I know this is weird. Anybody have any idea how to make this happen? I'm talking to some, you know, manufacturers in China, but the minimum run is a thousand. Mm. I'd rather do between like a hundred and five hundred. 
who's got ideas? And within 30 minutes, we had multiple connections, opportunities, links to specific other businesses in Philadelphia, say, go talk to this person, I think they can help. Here's someone who can help you build your prototype. Here's someone who's done this before, you can ask them questions. So like, you don't have to spend any time wondering or worrying about anything in a business when you're a part of this community of people who look after each other. Um, and I think that's the defining factor. When I go back to like, what is co-working? The defining factor of our flavor of co-working is we're trying to create an environment offline and online where people actually look after each other, where people are gonna watch each other's back. Um, you know, my background is in web development and I had a, a few different jobs before I went out on my own. And one in particular was a huge influence on what we do here on, at Indie Hall in that um, it was it was a creative agency building websites and web platform stuff for you know, business, consumer entertainment. You know, Campbell Soup Company was a client. Sony Pictures was a client, things like that. We built stuff that people actually interacted with. But the reason I joined this company was because I felt a vibe of what it was like to be in a professional environment where you could ask a question and you weren't looked at as dumb or inexperienced people would step up and come over and help and lift each other up and that mm. it wasn't that family vibe that i think people talk about which always in a way kind of creeps me out a little bit <laughs> but it is on a professional sense a vibe of people that actually are looking out for each other mm. and that's something that i think comes straight from the top it's something you lead by example it's something where you set expectations and let people know that it's not just ex uh, expected it's rewarded to look after your peers um the tricky thing about that is, is in a professional environment, you're sort of naturally uh, potentially in competition for certain resources. Like you might be up for a promotion and so is your coworker. So like there's this built-in competition that even in the best scenario almost undermines those relationships. So that's really cool about an environment like Indie Hall and a lot of other really great coworking spaces is you don't like, technically you could say, well, you're in competition for the same clients, but I don't think anyone in here works in an industry where there is a shortage of clients. There's right. no one client we're going after in the same way that there's one promotion we're going after. More often, there's opportunities for people to choose a more specific you know, uh, uh, niche or focus or a vector for the kinds of clients they pick. And when they say, this isn't the right client for me, but I know someone who in my community do who does do that, they specialize in that, like then to that client that you didn't just say, no, sorry, I don't do that you still have a positive mark in their eyes. So um, you know, there's so many of these benefits to doing business in this more collaborative way that always felt right to me, but I don't know, for some reason, I look at it the business world and I feel like a lot of the business world hasn't really gotten it yet. Right, so just to put things in a more like practical, concrete sense, if you're a 20 year old kid yeah. working out of your bedroom yeah. and you're a uh, Let's say you're, you're uh, an illustrator, right? Yep. Just to, or a graphic designer. Let's yep. go a little more general. You're a graphic designer. You could come down to Indie Hall and sign up today if yep. you wanted and have a desk soon. Yeah, today, and, right away. Okay, and then you would be able to get in, get out, do whatever. Um, and, and then you have more than just sort of quote unquote creative industry people here, right? It's not just web developers, photographers, designers, illustrators, you right? You need someone a, to look at a contract. There's like three lawyers here who'd be happy to take a look at it for you. Right? People that have done all different kinds of business development. So you're trying to get into an industry that maybe wants to hire you as a graphic designer. Um, there's a great example that comes to mind of somebody who always wanted to do band posters. Like that was his thing. Mm -hmm. And it was through this community that he was able to find not one, but at least two or three people from music venues that were like, we'd love to put you in a retainer to do band posters. Wow. So That's like awesome. it, it, whatever, I'm dead serious when I say it's like you it's it's not just whatever you need it's things that you don't even know you need yet yeah because one of the things that happened to me when I came in I didn't come in thinking this is a business networking thing oh I'll sign up and I'll be get I'll be getting jobs hand over fist from everybody but no exaggeration in the first six months and I forget what I was paying membership wise but it was much less I, I did ten thousand dollars in work that came just solely from like fellow indie haulers who are yeah. like, hey, you do this. Can you help me with this project? Can you help me with that? Can you join in this pitch with me? You know, well, I And I remember when you showed up too, one of the first things you did is you brought value. You showed up and you're like, hey, I know I'm kind of new to the community. I want to do a headshot day. 
And we were like, well, that sounds like a great idea. And I, I, my, my job, my team's job is to look for things like that and say, that's a great idea. How can we make sure that that's mm. easy for you to do? And you're a pro, so you just show up and you make it happen. <laughs> I don't but, know if I go that far, but 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 but, but honestly, <laughs> like the, I think it's in terms of like building credibility and trust in a community, you show up, you bring a little bit of value. That took you a day plus some time afterwards to do your post production too. But you a made a bunch of friends. You b earned a bunch of trust, and c over the long term built yourself this channel of new business. Mm. And I think that's the way. Like, I think people underestimate how much an afternoon of doing something for other people can pay off in their career. And I'll be honest, the, the number one reason I did it was because I didn't think I had enough headshots in my portfolio. So really? it's like, this is a perfect way to get a bunch of people in front of the camera. Brilliant. And, and yeah, I figured two people, everybody pretty much has a LinkedIn profile or Facebook or an about me page on their website. You totally. Need, you need or want a headshot. And this is something, I mean, the, the headshot thing, just as an example, is something that's showing up more and more in co-working spaces. We, we uh, host sort of a, an online mastermind for fellow co-working space operators. And at this point, at least three or four folks in in our group alone have in the last six months or so partnered up with a local photographer or a member who's a photographer to do a headshot day. In some cases, they've charged a nominal fee just to sort of guarantee that people show up. I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. Um, and every time it's been a hit. And they make it a public thing too sometimes where for them it's an opportunity to bring new members in. So, you know, if you're someone, if you're that photographer at home and you're like, I want to get out there, I want to get my name out, look up your local co-working space and say, hey, would it be possible to set up a day where I do free or, you know, $15, $20 headshots for your members in the community? Uh, if they say no, uh, I would be very surprised and ask them what they're concerned about. They're failing co-working yeah, space. Yeah, maybe, but like, <laughs> but like it's, you show up and offer a little bit of value. You're gonna, like I said, make a lot of friends. You're gonna build these the trust and relationships, and you're gonna open up a business pipeline in a really big mm -hmm. way. Very cool. Do you ever wear a hat? Every time I see you, you have sunglasses on your head. Sunglasses are my hat. <laughs> did you wear them to your wedding? I think I, you did. I did wear I sunglasses to my wedding. Um, That's right. I remember seeing it. We did, and also, and like it's a signature thing. I, I it's, it's a dude headband. It's okay. a it's absolutely a fashion accessory. Um, I have whether inside, outside, daytime, nighttime, um, and I collect. All different like colors and shapes of these knockoff wayfarers. They're they're not expensive sunglasses. No, ever. They're like five dollar shades. Um, and at my wedding, actually, I found a place on Amazon or whatever where I could buy a bunch of uh, neon banded shades for really cheap. All the and guests. So that was one of our our like Very wedding cool. favors. Was everyone had neon sunglasses <laughs> as well. So yeah, that's it's a uh, I don't know. It's it's enough of a signature that people that have like um, we had an artist draw headshots for some things and um, I think every photo of me, I've had, I have sunglasses <laughs> on. So sure enough, there was. Yeah. I didn't recognize you from your face. I saw the glasses on your yeah, head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then no, I knew it was you. It's a signature. Uh, it's a signature style. And that's very cool. So now what you do isn't, it's not like you get up and you're a roofer or something where it's very easy to define. What do your parents think about what you do? Do they understand <laughs> what it is that you do? That's a really good question. Uh, my parents are, are much better at understanding what I do now. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a particularly tricky part about it in the beginning where I actually I left college early um, to go out uh, into the professional world. By tricky, do you mean fighting with them? Um, not so, so, some fighting. It was more, it was more misunderstanding than fighting. It okay. was more, I mean, look, there's, if I've got one kryptonite, it's for you to tell me that you're disappointed in me. Like, if you want to level me, absolutely lay me That's out. That's good to know. Tell me that you're disappointed in something <laughs> that I did. And and um, when I left school and I was a little over halfway, that was a lot of what I – what I whether they said it explicitly, that was definitely what I felt. Um, and so one of the things that I learned is as I started having some success, I realized one of the values of having publications and press – um, is not actually all that good for the business, but it's great for sending home to your parents. Um, so <laughs> my parents magazine cover. My parents have read, I think, everything. And I'll tell you what, uh, to, I actually do want to give my parents credit. Um, my mom sent me an article this morning about a couple, I think they're in Southeast Asia or something along those lines, um, that are building sort of a live-work community for digital nomads. Um, and I haven't, I'll be, to be fair, I haven't read the article yet, so I'm not 100% sure <laughs> if this is true. But my mom said, she goes, have you, do you, A, do you know this person. My mom loves sending me an article about somebody who does something kind of like what I do and says, do you know this person? Sometimes. Um, but more importantly, she goes, I think 
you share a philosophy. And my parents don't entirely understand what I do, but I think they understand my philosophy, which again comes down to um, that work doesn't need to be this cutthroat competitive thing and that through like through earning trust, we have opportunities to work together and create things together that are bigger than we could create on our own. Um, I think my parents do really get that. And it's, it's kind of a beautiful thing too, because whether it's your parents or a client or a friend, having somebody understand why you do something, yeah. I think, far more important than actually factually having them understand what it is that you do. Totally, totally. And at this point, like, we're 12 years into Indie Hall, so they they get it. Do they understand how I make money doing the things that I do? Probably not. But they at least, I think they have their heads wrapped around to the point where they can describe to their, you know, friends and other family members when when somebody asks them, what is it that Alex does? Um, they have their own descriptions. Just that Google I think are, Indie yeah, Hall yeah, and yeah, look yeah. at the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, I mean, I... I <clears throat> I do get a lot of love and support from my family and my my dad in in particular was you know he's never worked for somebody else. He's been entrepreneurial since he so cool. since he's been out on his you know since he left college. I think that changes the way kids think cuz that's how my entire family's been that way. My gra both grandparents and it's my parents just everywhere yeah. I turn and look just about it's you know okay you know occasionally people get jobs and things but a lot of people in my family were you know oh, I'm going to be a plumber I'm going to do this I'm going to do that I'm going to and I think something that my dad and I have in common, uh, even though the way we work and the way we approach the world is often very different, is um, we it's not we don't work for ourselves uh, because we like it, although we do. We work for ourselves because we're really bad at working for other people. Mm. Um, and some of that is thick-headed stubbornness. Some of that is just seeing the world in a different way. And it's not that I don't like working for other people. It's that I'm legitimately not good at it. Um, I, I just don't like it. Uh, yeah. And, and I, um, and I see that like my, my dad would be a horrible, horrible employee basically <laughs> anywhere. Um, and I feel the same, like I've been in situations where, you know, a, a contract or a consulting gig turns into something long term, and where things gen generally break is when it, I start being perceived as more of an employee than as a hired gun or as an advisor um, because most employers don't see their employees as advisors. They see them as workers. Right. Um, I hope I try to perceive my team who I've hired as advisors. I, I constantly listening. They bring so much to the table. And I think a big part of that is because they, they've always had the capacity for it, but I try and work really hard to make it to create the space for them to to do that to show up and actually do that work and it was something i remember when i was when i was coming around more regularly it there was i don't know that there was a thing that i asked for or about in terms of hey could i do this or try doing that yeah. there was never anything that's like now nah, we don't do that here like not a single thing yeah. it was that was never the answer it was either let's look into it we'll try to figure out a way we can yeah. make this work or we could do most of what you're talking about some of it might be difficult i'm not yeah. saying we can't do it but it's it's We'll work on it. It's a collaboration. There, there's very few things that are hard no's. Um, more often, and even things that are hard no's, we try and approach it from a perspective of what would it take to make it a yes, right? Is this so far off no that it's never going to be a yes? Really very rarely. More often than not, it's here's what our constraints are. Here's what you should know. We have a vested interest in this being successful. So here's what we think is different between what you proposed and what it would take for it to win. Let's find somewhere in the middle, and yeah, we're mm. always always game to figure it out. Now, you were one of the first co-working spaces, as far as you know, in the country, right? Mm -hmm. This is what mm -hmm. back two thousand six. That's right. That's right. Um, how did that come about? Like, what was the thought process that went into it? So, I did not start with the intention to create a shared workspace, and I think that's important. I, it's not that I hadn't seen them; it's that I didn't think that's what I needed. Uh, and I remember I mentioned that agency that I worked at. Uh, were had that that vibe of people looking out for each other. Well, I left that agency, went to another one, that was the complete opposite. It was super cutthroat. Everybody <laughs> was at each other's throats, and it was what was even more interesting is that it was a lot of the same people from that previous agency, but it was under a different leader. So one leader changed the same people who previously looked out for each other into people who didn't. This was an agency wouldn't. here in town. Yeah. So I left. After uh, nine months or so, I was miserable, and I went on my own freelancing. And when I started freelancing, I loved having 
choice. I, I like everything was in my control. I could choose what I worked on, when I worked on it, who I worked with, what clients I had. If, it, if I was unhappy with a particular client or category of clients, I'm, I could say no. Right. Um, that's like the best part about going out and doing your own thing. Yeah. Right? I don't want to do that work. I'm not going to do it. Don't have to do it. Uh, so long as I'm getting my bills paid. Right. Yeah. The flip side though is I really missed having coworkers. Um, I missed having the, the good parts of having coworkers. There's always difficult parts of having coworkers and teammates, but the good parts, having people to bounce ideas off of. Um, if I've got a half-baked idea and I'm having trouble like working through it in my head, the easiest way to turn it into something real is to just talk through it with somebody. Um, and it's easier to do that with somebody who you know and trust than a complete stranger out of the gate, right? Um, I miss uh, ha never having to be stuck on a problem for more than a couple of minutes. I could always turn to somebody who had more experience than me and say, what am I not seeing? Why am I being a knucklehead here? Um, opportunities to inspire other people. Like it feels really good to share your work and have other people be like, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, and just the social silliness of going to a place and being around people and jokes and laughs and in, you know, your group of people that know each other, you have in jokes, like the true social glue of, of a good coworker relationship. I missed all that stuff, mm. but I also knew I didn't want to go back and get a job. And I also knew I didn't want to start an agency. Uh, I did not want to be responsible for the overhead of, you know, 10, 15, 20 people, even, you know, even a few people just yeah. was not my goal. So I was like, well, the problem is that I don't know who the other people that like me went out on their own, are sitting in their home office or their bedroom office, their dining room table, that are working on stuff that is, you know, this digital creative, creative stuff. We can make stuff online. We can share stuff online. But I don't know where the people that are in my own backyard are. I'm here in Philadelphia. It's 2006. It's easier for me to find professional peers in New York uh, San Francisco, LA, Seattle, than it is my own city. And Philadelphia is not a small, it's like, this is the fifth largest city in the country. There's a lot of people here. Why is it so hard to find somebody who I have these professional skills and goals in common with? And that was the core problem. It's like, where, where do I go? And I look at like the Chamber of Commerce and I'm like, well, it's kind of old school businesses tend to be brick and mortar or they're already really big, like not a lot of solo business owners and almost nobody doing business on the Internet. So right. not really my crew. Um, even things like, you know, SBN, Sustainable Business Networks, a lot of shared values, but not really my tribe in terms of the kinds of work that we were doing. Uh, and so I said, well, if I can't find the tribe. Maybe there's other people wandering around Philadelphia who also can't find their tribe. If I can find one, there's, that's proof that there's probably two right. and so on and so forth. And then there's more than a couple. And so, and that was literally it. It was one by one going out to these meetups that I had almost no interest in other than the hope that one out of 20 or 50 or 100 people I might have those things in common with and slowly started to meet them and then occasionally – find that one of them knows one or two other people and then the network grows. So did you go out and rent a space right out of the gate? No, man, it was like 10 months of those one-on-one -on -one small group interactions, hanging out. You know, if there was a meetup going on somewhere in the city, rather than going to the meetup by myself, I'd say, hey, group of friends that I've met over the last four months, um, we had an email list, it was really the only infrastructure we had. I was like, hey, this thing is going on, seems cool, who wants to go with? And then going to something by myself turned into going to something with other people. Mm. Then we started running some of our own things. One of the first things that we started doing was uh, we realized that a bunch of us were, would go and work from cafes near our homes once in a while just to get out of the house. Right, The same way you go to a cafe, go to Panera, anywhere that's got Wi-Fi. And you're just like, I just need to not be in my house today, um, even if it was just for a few hours. Mm -hmm. The thing we realized was if we coordinated which cafe we went to on which day, we would – have this sort of con the, the problem with a cafe is not the cafe like the wi-fi may not, might not be very good and the seats might not be very comfortable and it's noisy and distracting and all like that's not the actual problem the problem is is it's bodies not context you can't turn to a stranger in a cafe mm. and have that con conversation you can have that conversation they might look <laughs> yeah. at you crooked um but it's not instant right the it's not shared there's no shared context so we said if you know even just a few of us go to a cafe and camp out together for the day, that seems like a pretty cool experience. And we tried it and it was epic, amazing. 
And so we turned that into uh, like every other week sort of thing. We moved to different cafes around the city. Sometimes we'd go to a you know a bar that had a soccer game on, so we watched that. Um, you know, have a couple pints of beer while we're doing our work. Really anywhere that would have Wi-Fi and would let us hang out for the day. Which you know, the easy, it was better if we'd call ahead and let them know that we were coming. So at, at this point, you are like the antithesis of a corporate environment. Yeah, because we're <laughs> literally taking over anywhere that we possibly can. Um, this sort of like nomadic, um, this nomadic group of indie freelancers. Uh, you know, you know, and it was as literally as coordinated as as I described it. We'd pick a place. For the day, we send it to our email list. Maybe we'd publish it on Twitter as well and say, here's where we're going to be. Anybody want to join us? Mm. Come on by. And after doing that for a few months, we started having serious conversations about what it would be like to have a place where we could do that every day. Uh, and I had seen some early versions of co-working in San Francisco and New York. Uh, those were the first versions of people using the word co-working to describe these sort of community work environments. And... Uh, the, the trouble with the versions that I saw, and they were great, super inspiring, but they had other constraints that I was not uh, able to work with. So one version was where, you know, someone who was starting an agency was going to go rent an office anyway, and they're like, well, I'll just rent more office space than I need, and then we'll set up part of it as shared workspace. So worst case scenario, the agency is going to be able to pay for this anyway. Um, but we like having other interesting creative people coming through. Um, and I actually pitched that idea to that last agency that I worked at where I was miserable. And they said, Alex, this idea is really stupid. It's never going to work. And I said, okay. <laughs> and that was one of the many things that led to me, me leaving that job. And 12 years later, here we sit. Right. So, so the agency model, I call it the sugar daddy model. So the agency is effectively subsidizing the cost of this workspace to fit out all of those things. The trouble with it, um, more than anything is the long term, right? So let's say the community actually starts thriving and growing and it outgrows the space that the agency can provide. But the space was subsidized by the agencies. So it's going to be very difficult or impossible for that community to then go find its own space and be self-sufficient. The flip side of that is maybe the agency out, you know, starts to grow, needs that space it was giving away or, or subsidizing and says, sorry, community. We need you to leave. Same problem, though, because it was subsidized. Where are they going to end up? Um, and we see that today with communities that end up at Indie Hall where they've been given free space until suddenly the free space is no longer convenient or an option. And now they're stuck looking for another free space where they know that there's a pretty good chance it's going to happen again. So uh, it's good to pay for the space that you use. Free space is nice, but look for a sponsor. Look for a supporter. Look for uh, you know a, a jar or a hat in the middle of the room that people can chip in money. Pay for the space that you're in. And not because I'm in this business of renting space, but because it's really, really painful when I watch groups not able to be self-sustaining even after they leave here. And I expect mm. that they're not going to be here forever. And so hence, hence is born also part of the membership fees. Precisely. So the other version of the business model that I had seen that was sort of problematic was sort of the old school art collective model where you'd go and rent a, you know, some space, you'd build out studios, and then you know, let's say there's 10 artists sharing this, then you add up all the expenses, you divide by 10. Right. Uh, it's fine until somebody needs to leave, and now all of a sudden the same expenses are being shared by nine, as you know, it has to fit your budget. And it has to fit your budget. Um, and that can create a lot of stress and tension on those relationships. And remember, I'm in this for the relationships. So our goal with the first version of Indie Hall was how do we figure out a business model, the membership model that you're talking about, that creates a buffer so that this thing is completely self-sustaining on its own, where people can come and go as needed because life happens, work happens, things change. You want to stay flexible. Um, but also people have incentives to stay involved at different levels. So rather than leaving, you downgrade, those sorts of things. Or, you know, things are picking up in your business. You want to be here more often. You want to bring in a teammate. You want them to be able to be a part of the community too. That's all built in. So our membership model um, was sort of a hybrid of a few different membership models I'd seen out there. Uh, and that's the model we've been running on ever since. Hmm. That's very cool. So – for some, you know, if there's a 19-year-old kid out in Denver or something and he can't find a co-working space, doing exactly what you're talking about. Go find a few friends. Yeah. Um, and if you don't have the friends, go start finding meetups. Yeah. You know, there's plenty of websites where you can do that, Facebook and the, so on and so the forth. The biggest mistake I see people make is they don't have a co-working space, so they go and they sign a lease. Mm. 
and now you've got sign two, the lease and then figure I'll fill it with people. And later. now you've got two problems. Now you've got you you don't have friends. <laughs> Sorry, uh, you don't you don't you don't you're missing the community and you have to pay bills, right? Um, you can solve those problems in a particular order so that you solve. Because here's the thing: is you might build this community of graphic designers, of illustrators, of videographers, whatever, or, or just all different kinds of things, right? Diversity is one of the biggest strengths of building this kind of community. Um, go out and meet people at those meetups, wherever it, wherever you need to go. Go and hunt. Um, you may learn that what people really need isn't a shared workspace. It might be something entirely different. Like the only reason Indie Hall looks the way it looks is because the people who started it, myself and my friends, were people who worked on laptops. If we were a bunch of farmers, it looked more like a farmer's market. Yeah, some maybe. cows in here. Yeah, <laughs> but so, I mean, you, you get what I'm saying. Like the the biggest. Um, this is super f strange, but I, I think you'll get what I'm saying. When when we started Indie Hall, I didn't really have a lot of other examples to look at, and so the downside of that is we had to figure out a lot of things on our own. But the upside to that is I there was no preconceived notion of what it needed to be. And, and that answer is given by why you're doing what you're doing. Exactly. And so today I see people, they, they see a co-working space, and to them, they're like, oh, I want one of those. <laughs> okay, great. Lofty goals, my yeah, so child. And there's, again, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with it. But that doesn't preclude you from doing the work to – find the people who want that to exist as well. So you're talking about people who are look at a co-working space like, ooh, there's a great way to make money. Not even, I mean, maybe. I mean, there's a, plenty of that in the real estate world, without a doubt. But think about it. It's not even that's is a great way to make money. Um, it, it's sort of like people who view it like a dollhouse. So think about, and this is less of a thing these days, I think. It's going to be hard for me because I hate the color pink. But yeah. <laughs> I'll give it a shot. So, but think about it like this way. Think about the people who love coffee and they think, I'm going to make the perfect cafe. I'm going to go check out a bunch of cafes and figure out what's great about some and terrible about others, and they create the perfect cafe. Mm -hmm. Those cafes generally don't do very well. And it's not because those they're not good ideas. It's because that person spent all their time creating the dollhouse image in their head so that they could play house. It's the beautiful person with no soul. Yeah, it's versus someone who is both a you know they're a practitioner of the the thing that it is that they want to bring people together around. In this case, it was you know being an independent, being a freelancer, being a creative. Okay. Um, like you got to be. You gotta be in the you have to be in the audience for it as well. So like the best place, I think the people who succeed the most with this are people who need it for themselves. Not people who were like, I spent six months in a co-working space somewhere else. I'm gonna bring this to my city. Um, you can absolutely do that, but the the but you still need to go back to square one and say, okay, who is the audience, who is the community that I most connect with? And how can I start bringing them together before I take on the overhead of – like signing a lease should be way scarier to people than I think it is. Mm. So I would say you can wait until people are begging you. For a space. For a space to sign a lease. So you you go and work at a co-working space in wherever, Jakarta, and you come back. That was amazing. I got to bring this to my city. You should want to bring it to your city. You should want to bring the community to your city. Bingo. And that's where you're talking about finding that community in your city. Yeah. And then from that, when there's 20 of you or 15 of you, whatever yeah. it may be. I tell people to look for the first their first 10, the first 10 people. And I'm realizing that people misinterpret what I what I mean when I say that. And, and just I, real quick to interrupt you, this is something that literally anybody can go out and do. Yes, I mean I've helped hundreds of people do this, and it's, you don't need to be a like super pro expert. You don't need to have money, a lot of money, and, and you I don't need to stop being a photographer, graphic designer, writer, whatever it may be. You nope. just find find your friends, get yes. together, and work together. Exactly. Uh, the, finding the first ten people isn't finding the first ten people who are willing to sign up for a co working space. I should have been more specific when I said find your first 10. <laughs> find your first 10 is finding your first 10 people who are kind of addicted to each other. The people who are excited for some part of their work day to be spending time with other people, mm. right? Um, you know, it's it's literally find people who want each other. If you can, it's very easy to find people who want space. 
The trouble with finding people who want space is at a certain point, they're not going to need space anymore. Then what's their reason to want to be a part of this? Right? If you find people who want to be around other people, find people who um, have those common goals, common values, common identity. Um, you know, I, I was doing a, a coaching call with a guy a couple days ago who um, is from, uh, from one region, went somewhere else for school, came back and is trying to set up co-working in the city where he grew up, but he hasn't been in like eight years. Mm. And one of the things that we talked about a bunch, I was like, what about the other people in your city who like you left and came back? I was like, I, I think you're potentially undervaluing the strength of that identity because it's a place that feels like home, but you also feel kind of like a stranger. So you may not feel isolated in your work, but you feel sort of disconnected from the world around you, there's a really good chance that if you were to create a meetup for people who used to live in this city, left and came back, that you'd end up with a room, a diverse room of really interesting mm -hmm. people who actually have something in common that will drive their desire to, to help one another. Right, the first part of the connections are already there. Exactly. Well, and, and, and to your point about finding people who are addicted to being together, you're talk. It's not something where you go out and in five minutes you know, ah, this dude isn't. He's not the right one. It's, it's you just go out, meet people, try to make friends, and it just happens. Yes. Right. It's a, it's like how do you find your best friend? You didn't. It just happens. People worry about finding the right people, and I'm like, who are you to judge? How do you know if somebody's the right person? Also, like, people are multifaceted, and by that I mean weird. <laughs> like people, like people aren't defined by the skill they have, by the place they live, by the politics they hold. Like people are multidimensional. And so like get to getting to know people on more than one level takes time. And there are definitely reasons to, you know, raise an eyebrow and say, I'm anxious around this person. If people are are malicious or destructive or just straight up mean, you don't need to spend more time on that. But if you're looking to attract people who are curious and interested and generous, you know, the things that they're interested in don't need to be the same in order for them to be interested in each other. Right. So tell me a little bit about your childhood. What was it like growing up? Where'd you grow up? Hit me with some of the backstory. Yeah. Before I, Indy Hall. I grew up in uh, Hellertown, Pennsylvania. Oh, I know where Hellertown is. Yeah. So a tiny little two mile stretch of nothing just outside of Bethlehem. Um, famous for Lost River Caverns. We had an actual cave that you could like, go <laughs> into, which is weird. Um, but I grew up on, uh, I grew up on, essentially like the residential version of farmland. Like we had a corn farm on one side, a horse farm on the other. Um, I spent most of my childhood cutting grass. Uh, is I'm joking. Long but it's, afternoons. But it's true. I'd come home from school and like for seven months out of the year, it was always cutting grass. Um, you know, relatively small school. You know, I think graduating class was like 150 people. It's not tiny, tiny, but relatively small. Um, and I don't know. I mean – I would say I was a good student up until the point that I wasn't. <laughs> um, you started to sprout those wings. Yeah, I was – I mean my teachers – I'll put it this way. Teachers liked me, but I got in trouble a lot. Okay. And it's not because – and there's other kids that got in trouble because they were you know, being destructive in some way. Mm -hmm. I, I was the kind of person who got in trouble because I was curious. I was always like poking things apart and asking why. Right. Um, so, you know, when I when I come across teachers that I, you know, had growing up and they've seen what we do here and, you know, for, for them, certain elements of my work are not a surprise at all. Um, but, you know, my my version, my version of getting in trouble was generally fueled more by curiosity. I got in trouble one year for um, we had a for being a small town school, we had gotten a grant or we'd won some sort of I think we won a grant to install like a pretty high tech computer network in our entire school district. Okay. Um so like there was these compact presarios and there's I mean I don't think it was like a one to one, but we had hundreds of computers in each of the schools, which was pretty rare at the time. And it was all networked and everything had access to the internet. So this, I think we're talking like mm, 96, 97. So oh, like wow. pretty so early we were, that we had access a to bunch of nerds at that school. real technology. <laughs> well, I definitely was one of those nerds. That's for sure. Um, and so I was being the curious one that I was started poking around and 
um, Novell was the network management software that was used to manage logins and access control and all those things. Um, and I started researching and learning about how Novell worked. And somewhere along the way, found some security holes, found my way into launching the Novell admin control panel, so on and so forth. I didn't actually do anything. I just was in a place I wasn't supposed to be. You just walked be. in a door that wasn't. <laughs> and so I get called into the principal's office. And my mom's there. And she's upset. And the disciplinarian's not really sure what to do with me because I think this might have been the first time they ever had somebody in yeah, trouble. Yeah, for I like, was going to say, do they understand even what's going on at that point? No, or it's just well, he and, did something he wasn't supposed to do. And to make matters worse, I suppose, uh, was the network guys – I mean, again, like the IT industry was relatively young. And so these weren't – super experienced IT professionals either. They just saw access logs attached to my name. I'm in a place I'm not supposed to be. And remember, I got there through a security hole that they left open. Right. So I think more than anything, in hindsight, as an adult, I think they were more embarrassed than they were mad. I didn't actually, like, I didn't erase any hard drives or change anybody's grades or anything like that. But they were embarrassed and they wanted to be reprimanded. But at the end of the day, you helped make the school a better place. Well, so... Yeah. We'll get there. <laughs> so what happened was they, you know, they're basically telling the principals like, you know, you weren't supposed to do this. And I was like, yeah, but the door, <laughs> but the door was open. Right. Uh, and so these two network guys, you know, sitting across the table, their arms are crossed and they're pissed. And they're like, well, tell us how you did it. And I was like, no, that's your job. And that did not make my situation any better. <laughs> yeah, what do you, you want to explain uh, what I, I did wrong? I refused to help them do their jobs. And so I got suspended and I got kicked off the network for the remainder of high school <laughs> without like direct supervision. Like yeah. I could use it if I needed to for class, okay. uh, but I had to be supervised. So I'm on, I'm in computer jail uh, starting my freshman year of high school. Wow, so you were a, a young buck at I this was point. An, I was a very young idiot. Um, <laughs> Here's where it gets excellent, though. Uh, some, I guess it was like my sophomore and junior year. We got they hired someone who was more experienced to run the network stuff. Um, in parallel to that, I got involved in the theater program, um, which we can talk more about if you like. But my path into theater started on stage, but quickly turned to off stage, and I got involved in sound design. Okay. Uh, and we got this super high tech sound system that was powered by a computer. It was all like the PV digital mixing hardware and software setup. Um, and they left you alone with another computer. Well, so this one wasn't networked. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I did learn how to use it. I became one of the most knowledgeable people in the school on it. And we did a lot of diagnostics and we did a lot of upgrades. But because it was a computer, this guy who had been hired to be, to run the network, like basically the sound system fell under his purview. Okay. Um, he didn't know a lot about me and my history, but he knew me through the sound system stuff where he saw me be like knowledgeable and helpful and I learned stuff and I was always trying to make it better. Um, and so my senior year, I had an option for an independent study. And I said, Mike, I want to do an independent study with you. I want to work on the school network. And he's like, well, I understand that might be a problem. <laughs> and I was like, no, I know. Well, you're, but, but you're three years removed from the security loophole thing. Yes, and there's, and been... there's adults running the show now. <laughs> so I was like, I know, but I, I, I think I really – like this is where I think and, – and being 100 percent genuine here, that was what I thought I wanted to do. At the time, I was like this computer networking thing is actually really interesting to me. Um, you were an IT guy. I, that was my goal. Like when I went to college, my plan was to – learn business so I could start an IT consulting firm. So this was actually like, I saw this as part of my career. Um, and with his support, I was able to get an independent study working in the department that had previously gotten me suspended from the network permanently. <laughs> That's the kind of trouble I got in. Um, That's the best kind of trouble though. I think so. Um, and yeah, I mean, I learned so much about all the, the systems and tools and um, even like system design, just like thinking about how these pieces all fit together. Um, and, and also at a time where like technology was moving so fast. Yeah, no kidding. So it was very easy to get, uh, to, to get an edge 
just by being someone who wanted to learn. So you're talking, this is what, 98, 99? So my, I was in high school from, uh, from 97 to, to, I graduated in 2002. So yeah, so you're talking less than 10 years later, boom, the iPhone. Yeah. That's how fast. Right? Isn't that wild? It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. So tell me more about this theater thing you, you started. So uh, kind of on a lark, I think, uh, I tried out for a play. I guess I should back up a little bit. My high school had, a, 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 in the region, a pretty well-known high school theater program. Um, there was a couple of families in town um, that were big supporters of the arts, and so they helped support it financially. Uh, and so we had access to like scripts and performances of stuff that was on Broadway. Um, you know, Joseph and the Technicolor Dream Co. Peter Pan. Um, we did a summer performance of Titanic when that was a musical. Um, so all kinds of wacky stuff. And so uh, the, I, try, I, can, I wish I could remember if someone convinced me to try out or if I just did it because I thought it would be fun. I was going to say, you don't really strike me as a theater guy. I would have never, unless you had said something, never pegged mm -hmm. you. And and to be honest, maybe there was a girl. Who knows? But I <laughs> but I tried out for Peter Pan. Finally, I, the truth comes and I out. Got a, and I got a, the part of John, the Wendy Michael John. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm so pop culture literate. I know who Peter Pan is. But okay, so there's other than that, Peter, Peter no Pan context. takes three kids from uh, an English house and takes them to Neverland. Okay, um, Wendy Darling is sort of the the love interest of sorts. Although in hindsight, that's a little creepy. Has two young uh, has an older brother, I think, and a younger brother. I was the older older brother, John. Okay, um, sort of meant to be the straight man of the trio. <laughs> um, and it was fun. Uh, the, they actually, because of it's Peter Pan and there's the whole flying mm -hmm. thing, um, they rented a flying rig and I got oh, to really? fly on That's stage. Cool. Uh, as a, Rigged up with cables and whatnot. Yeah, it was pretty wild. Um, I did a little more on stage stuff. Uh, and I, I think it, most of it fell apart when I realized that like, I like being on stage. I like a microphone, as, as you can tell. Um, <laughs> I like being on stage. I like the performance aspect of it. Um, I like the storytelling. Um, I grew up around theater. Like my mom is really into musical theater in particular. Um, so I always enjoyed it. I never really saw myself in it. I tried on stage and it was fun. Um, I'm not, I can't dance. Mm. I'm like a really lousy dancer. Hey, same here, man. So I, the choreographer. I'm like a drunk penguin out yeah. there if I try to do anything. <laughs> so I was like, I was the choreographer's worst nightmare. So I think that was one of the many things that made me a little self-conscious about being on stage. But I enjoyed the people. Um, you know, it was, it was a bunch of geeks. I mean, all the stereotypes, you know, like all the tropes and stereotypes. Yeah, it really, I mean, <laughs> you say that. And honestly, you say that and it's really true. Like, it was a really tight-knit group of kids. I was, I don't want to say it was an outcast. Um, I didn't have large f groups of friends in high school. I was more of the chameleon. Or like I could hang out and get along with just about anybody, but I wasn't tight with a group. Um, except I would say like the theater group, I was I was pretty tight with. Also you spend a ton of time together. Yeah, I'd imagine. Um, so, so yeah, you get close. And you know, actually before you even said it, I hadn't really thought about it. Like that was, it wasn't the first community, but it was definitely one of the earliest creative communities that I think I was, mm. I was a part of in, in real life. I did a lot of online community stuff too. Um, so I transitioned to, to backstage stuff. So I did a little bit of stage crew. Um, and then when, when the sound design stuff came along, uh, I got Fell really into it. it. It was really, it was a neat set of challenges because it was technical. Um, it was live. Um, and it was systems, uh, and you know we're talking about you know a two thousand person auditorium. Every night was different because mm. you know, and we're different from rehearsal too because you do sound design for the acoustics of the room, and the acoustics of the room change based on who's sitting in the seats, what you know how the sound bounces off of them, even what they're wearing, the you know the the sound levels, how they're responding. So it's a very mm. like it's a very dynamic role to be playing uh in a live production it was a ton of fun um that was pretty cool. cool yeah that's pretty cool so getting back to indie hall just yeah. for a, a brief moment here what are some of the challenges that you face what's the stuff that maybe people on the outside don't know about other than what we've talked about in terms of you sign the lease you better 
uh, you better be there. Do you have problem members? I mean, not everybody just goes along to get along. Some people, like you said, a lot of us kind of generally want the same things. So we might have different ideas about how to get there. Yeah. But generally, we like we don't want to hurt each other. We want to look out for each other, things like that. But occasionally, there's somebody who's kind of not really on the same page as everybody else. How do you deal with stuff like that? And what kind of challenges like that have you had in a space like this? Well, I mean, the way people treat each other I'll say, th thankfully, the majority of the time, we set our ex we set our standards high, right? So you come in and we, we the first thing you do is you go on a tour, and a lot of the tour it's not a physical tour of the space; it's sort of a tour of expectations. And here's how to make the most out of this environment, this community. And we can read pretty quickly based on someone's questions during a tour whether or not this is going to be right. good for them. It's also to a degree, uh, because we had that core community, there's an element of self-selection where people that might cause trouble generally will come and realize that it's gonna be really hard for them to break through the barrier of true social bonds to cause trouble and so they'll go somewhere else where the barrier is lower. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say that trouble doesn't get through. Um, I've only had to ask I mean, it's less than a, uh, less people than I can count on one hand that I've ha specifically had to ask to leave mm. over 12 years. Is that difficult to do? Extraordinarily. Those are the worst days of the job. Mm. Um, because it doesn't, it's not because the person's a bad person. Um, it's generally because something is wrong. Um, I, it's, it's hard because I put myself, well, it's hard because the things that make myself and my team really good at our job is we're, we, we focus on being empathetic and really trying to understand where someone is. Um, I try and meet people where they are. And when someone is lashing out, when someone is being aggressive, I still have to assume that's coming from somewhere. And I don't want to put them in a worse place, but I also can't have them taking that out on our people, right? Right. Well, and I, because I look around and I see people, you know, people leave their computers and things here. So there has to be a certain level of trust where people aren't going to just walk out with my stuff. Yeah. And we set that, that expectation through um, something that we sort of model after a neighborhood watch where, uh, I mean, the expectation is, is people are looking after each other's stuff that's built in. But we have another elevated level of that where in order to get 24 seven access to Indy Hall, one of the steps is getting signatures from three other existing key holding members saying they've gotten to know you and they trust that you're going to be a part of this network of people that look after the place and the stuff, the place that we share and the people and stuff in it. That's, so that's super cool. So when you're a full time member, there's actually an extra bit of responsibility uh, that an expectation that if something is wrong, you speak up and you do something about it. Um, and that could be somebody, you know, trying to walk off with some valuable piece of equipment. It could also be a situation where like, we had a situation years ago where there was a really bad storm and we had a leak and somebody was there after hours and it leaked while they were there and they went out of their way to move the stuff that was potentially gonna get damaged by water out of the way and to go out of their way to call someone who lived nearby for help and then to get that information to myself and the team as quickly as possible. And I was like, when I said thank you, they were like, it's part of why I'm here. Like to them, it was a no brainer. They're like, I'm not here just to consume resources. I'm here to look after this place. Mm. Uh, so, so yeah, we try and instill that from the start. Uh, and when you don't, you can't expect everybody. I don't expect everybody to participate at the, you know, the highest levels of that game. But so long as you're have some sense of awareness, most of the time, it's it's generally pretty helpful. And we've done some work over the last couple of years, and I want to give credit to one of our team members in particular. Her name is uh, Sam Abrams. Um, helped me uh, understand and helped me connect with a bunch of other other members who. Um, Help me understand the value of having a more formal code of conduct, which is something that we hadn't ever had before. We had this more general standard and expectations that we expect everyone to look after themselves, look after each other, look after the place and stuff that we share. Hmm. Um, but we didn't ever say explicitly, these things are inappropriate. Like if you do this, it's not cool. Hmm. Right. And more importantly, it's everyone's job to look after everybody and make sure that no one's being uh, being gone after in these ways. You know, it's funny. I so years ago when I first signed up, I never told anyone the story, 
but it kind of triggered my mm -hmm. mind thinking back on Amy and now talking about this. It was my goal to eventually be here 24 seven kind yep. of thing, or, you know, have the 24 seven access, but I was to, to say that I was skeptical about leaving equipment and computers and things here is a little bit of an understatement. Yeah. So I came after hours one day just with my basic, and it was like a week or two after I joined. I'm like, yep. you know what? I'm going to just try to get in yep. and just see. Yep. And Amy was there at the door. Yep. And she's like, no. Yeah. No. You can't, no. I don't know who you are. That's what she didn't even say. Like, it's not your membership level. She said, I don't know who you are. Yeah. I'll never forget it. Her, yeah. I think Tom, her husband's name is Thomas, Thomas right? Yeah. He was there as well. And they're like, no, we don't know who you are. We can't, we can't let you in. Yeah. And we're going to have to find somebody who knows you. Yeah. And I remember at the moment thinking, like, Doggone it. Wow. It works. Crazy. Right. And it's the thing where I should have been upset, but I wasn't because I knew what I was trying to do. Yeah. And it was kind of like, okay. Yeah. Okay. There's something going on here. I've never told anybody that. That's really cool. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, there's the safety of stuff, but we've been thinking a lot about like the safety of, of people too. And, you know, uh, you know, I think about, and none of, none of the work we've done with the code of conduct in the last year has been a direct response to the stuff that's been, you know, coming out about all the sexual harassment in Hollywood. And the truth is, is that's in, in almost every industry and it's a big problem. Um, it's a big problem in the tech world. And there's a lot of, it's, this is not exclusively a tech community, but there's a bunch of tech people. And uh, it's really important to me at a, at a st core level that if someone wants to be a part of this community, that they know and truly believe that if they come here, they're gonna be safe and looked after. And there was a blind spot for me because I had never been the, the target of uh, sexual harassment or something like it to say, well, if I, like, why do I have to say explicitly that it's not allowed? It should be understood. Right. When in reality, in the world, it should be understood, but it's so often right. not. Yeah. So simply by us saying out loud and on paper, we don't stand for this. The response we've gotten, and not just from women, but from people in general that we're paying attention to this and that it's really just a statement of saying out loud, we care and we won't put up with it, right. um, has been eye-opening for me and uh, it's a learning process too because uh, the other side of it back to your point about like how do you deal with it is there's such a spectrum of understanding and concern and hurt and pain that comes from uncomfortable situations and not every uncomfortable situation merits throwing somebody out mm, right. right so it's more of how do we as a community work together to make an uncomfortable situation either less likely to happen in the first place, or if it, if and when it does happen, that it doesn't perpetuate or allow more trouble to, to walk in the door. It, Same sort of philosophy though, is like we're thinking at it from a design perspective and, mm. and it's a mix of communication and, and habit and, and getting sort of everyone working towards the same goal of when you see or hear something that, that makes you uncomfortable, that it's okay to say, you know, that wasn't cool. Right. And that you know that there's people around there and be like, yeah, that wasn't cool. Yeah. Not to chastise somebody, not to put somebody out. It does need to be, you know, done. Right. On it's about the good of the community first, not about just punitive and it's beating about you make, down. And making people better, right? Yeah. I, I, my goal of any of this is to help somebody be the best version of themselves. And by walk, I want somebody to leave here feeling better than, than they felt when they walked in the door. That's very, that's like a tangible goal. And if people have any reason to not feel great the moment they walk in the door to begin with, feel that uncertainty that they're not sure if they're going to be looked after or taken care of because they've had experiences in other workplaces or maybe even other co-working spaces that it makes a ton of sense to me that we'd want to say out loud, you're like, I can't say you're not going to experience that. What I can say is we won't let it happen. Mm, right. Yeah. So last question, I just want to wrap up with this. Do you have yep. any irrational fears or phobias that you deal with? I do. That, that we don't know about. I do. Um, uh, clowns, sharks, and heights. <laughs> Wait, so how did the heights thing work with the rigging at the theater? Um, I mean, I got over it. It's not like a – it's not that I'm so irrationally afraid of heights that I won't do it. Like I've done zip lining and stuff like that. But You just scream a lot. I Yeah, and like, <laughs> but like the bottom falls out. Like I know some people <laughs> like the idea of – you know, being suspended, like it gives them a rush. It does not give me a rush. I can get over it, but like it is not fun. Um, so, so like height. So, for instance, you know, uh, going to have you been to Toronto? No. All right. So the CN Tower in Toronto um, is one of their very, tallest buildings, tall, right? Yeah. And they have this observation platform, and they have a platform that's this like high uh, density 
plexiglass oh. so you can walk out and yeah. like look straight down and they've got this sign that says this can hold 16 hippos and I'm like don't care don't care I'm not yeah. walking out over that well 16 hippos already been out there what if I'm the 17th or also Sears like, Tower Willis Tower in Chicago has the same kind of thing I went up there and I'm like nope not happening or like not walking, worth it. walking up to the edge of like the Grand Canyon or even just like a cliff like mm. I start I, I think there's a very human thing that if as you get closer to it like your body kind of tenses up um, I get, I feel like I get that earlier or like to a, a degree of intensity. So it's not like, I, I just joke. It's not actually a fear of height. It's a fear of falling and yeah. it's not even a fear of falling. It's a fear of landing. Yeah. I was um, going to say, yeah. Like they say, it's not the fall that hurts. It's yeah. a sudden stop. So there's heights, um, <laughs> clowns. I just find clowns in like, ugh, just make it cre so creepy. There's it's nothing like, in your childhood that really had like a well, weird neighbor who. No, I mean, I, I always thought clowns were weird. I was so back to the theater thing a little bit. I was also involved in magic, like performance. Oh, okay. um, even before You're I got like in, sleight of hand kind like of magic. Sleight of hand and a little bit of stage magic. Actually, be, that was before. You never sawed anyone in half. Uh, I didn't saw anybody in half, but I I did. Uh, it was a mix again, a mix of not so much the big illusions, but I was more into like the intimate, like card tricks, coin tricks. And now stuff you see like it, that. but now you don't. Exactly. Um, so that was maybe my precursor to the, the theater stuff as well. Um, and there was definitely like there's some Venn diagram of magicians and clowns, and I've just always felt that clowning was just like eerie and made made me uncomfortable. Um, I did. Uh, have a, f a friend in college who like went to clown school was a clown was a magician he was also completely unhinged so all he did was <laughs> reinforce all of my anxieties come come little around, child ar around clowns and no i won't go see it uh my wife went to go see it with her girlfriends and i was like sweet have yeah. fun i'm never gonna i don't yeah. like scary movies to begin with definitely not seeing a scary movie about clowns i won't sleep for weeks and then sharks um never had a bad interaction with a shark either it's just like and here's here's where I'll say it's irrational. Like, I already think going in the ocean is insane because it's full of like, stuff, really stuff really you. scary ugly yeah. things. Um, but I'll, like my shark fear is like if I'm in a swimming pool and there's water behind me, my brain goes there might be a shark back there. Like, I wow. know <laughs> that that is not, like, I know. It's like the boogeyman in the basement as a it's kid kind of thing. And where you're like, you're walking up the stairs and you start walking a little bit faster. It's that, but yep. it's in any, I mean, honestly, like. That's such a, a strange a thing. Bathtub. So wow. I'll, I'll well, wait, hold you, a shark in the bathtub? Yeah, if there's so water behind me and I water. can't see, any body of water, if I can't see it, there's a shark. So you take a shower there, with your back against the wall? There might be a shark. Well, there's not that much, it's not standing water. Um, like that makes uh, it rational I, I somehow. <laughs> yeah, so sharks and <laughs> clowns and heights. And I'll tell you a funny story about how all three got connected. Um, there's an awesome organization. It's not just in Philadelphia called Outward Bound. Okay. Um, that does they like clowning, kite sailing no. specialists or something? <laughs> so <laughs> Outward Bound does like outdoorsy activities to help young people build uh, team building skills and confidence and things like that. And one of their big annual fundraisers in Philadelphia is a repelling uh, – thing where you go so it's a liberty one or two one of the big skyscrapers in center oh, city okay. you go up to the observation deck and you rappel down the side of a skyscraper mm. and so it's sort of like um uh for, for the fundraising part of it is like when you raise funds for a run you okay. say you know would you donate x amount of dollars in order you know if i complete the run so you get people to donate x amount of dollars for you to walk down the side of a building so would you start with a $10,000 minimum or something? So I, I had a woman reach out to me, and she's like, we'd love to have you involved in this. And I was like, mm -hmm. here's the deal. <laughs> I'm really not into heights. Um, I recognize that this is safe and all these well, things. Don't worry. I, we'll have some clowns there. They'll cheer I you said, up. I said, I said, but if there's one way to get me is when it's for the kids. Like mm -hmm. something that's going to – like I, I feel so fortunate to have had the support from adults in my young my young life um, in my creative pursuits again magic theater technology I got my first computer job in a computer shop when I was 13 years old uh, and was learning from adults um, even those two knuckleheads that got me suspended but then I came back to work on that. like I had I had adults that supported me and gave me opportunities and a lot of kids don't have that. And so if this, if me walking down the side of a skyscraper is somehow going to help some kid get something that I was lucky enough to get, then I'll get over the, uh, over the height thing with one condition, that you can promise me that at the bottom of that 
uh, building, there will be no clowns <laughs> and no sharks. <laughs> <laughs> they could tell, well, they could get you started by having clowns chase you off the edge of the Her building. Her response was, so you're going to be called Team Clown Shark. Is that right? Uh, but yeah, so, um, so the... The last two years, the weekend that it was, I've been scheduled to be out of town. Um, but 2018 is the year that I'm going to walk down uh, Liberty <laughs> as Team Clown Shark. Well, make sure you take a video camera or something. That'd be pretty. Uh, yeah, we'll strap, strap a, a GoPro to your head or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let everybody hear it in the hall laugh I'll, at you. I'll be screaming, that's for sure. <laughs> Dude, yeah. well, speaking of magic, this place is magical. It's an incredible community, an awesome ambiance. I love the place. I wish I was around more than I am. Me too. Um, I appreciate it. And you just, you've built something real special here. Thanks, man. And I appreciate everything you've done. And I, I can't, there's so many nights that you're up till three in the morning that nobody ever hears about or sees about. And that's where I'm like, you look around and you see what you've done. And it's like, how many of those nights were there? So I just, uh, I mean, I guess thanks for everything you've done. It's, it's a, it's a super duper cool place. And it's such a good thing for the creative community, but even be beside the creative community, just people who are looking for that space here yep. in the city. Yep. Um, I think it's really, really something special. Well, I'll say to the folks that are listening, you know, if you're ever in Philadelphia or near Philadelphia, want to come by, even if it's just for a day or you're visiting Philadelphia, I, I've been reminding people, uh, people go to New York City all the time and they don't realize that Philadelphia is a less than two hour train or bus I'll ride away. away. Um, give us a day, better yet, spend an overnight. We'll show you an awesome time in this city. If you've not been to Philadelphia in the last 10 years, you've never been to Philadelphia. And if you've never been to Philadelphia, you're missing out on one of the best cities in the world. I firmly, firmly, firmly believe that. Um, and if we can uh, have Indy Hall be a part of you calling Indy Hall home, even if it's just for a day or two, uh, consider this my my open my open hand, my welcome home. We'd love to have you here. The pineapple. Come on, come on by. <laughs> cool. Well, I appreciate it, Alex. Let's wrap this thing up. Awesome. Um, catch time. you guys later. Hey, before you go, thanks for checking out my podcast. If you enjoyed it, make sure you subscribe to the show using the iTunes link in the video description below. While you're there, I would love it if you would give this podcast an honest review on iTunes. The ratings and reviews are really cool to see. If you don't think the show is worth five stars, well, let's just pretend it is. Don't forget, new podcasts arrive every Friday at 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with an occasional surprise show on Tuesdays. Until next time, this was The Dodcast. <laughs>